Hello and welcome to Captains of Industry. My name is Charles Mutonga and this month we're in Nairobi about to speak to James Moria, who is the CEO of Centum Investments. Uh, welcome to the program, James. Thank you, Charles. And uh, we haven't had many stories in this country where someone rises from intern to CEO, yeah. same organization, now in control of $1.8 billion. Uh, briefly tell us about your story. No, my story has been uh, an interesting journey. I I graduated with a degree in law and a CPA, and um, at the time there were very limited opportunities. But I was lucky to get an internship uh, at uh, at Centum at the time. It was known as ICDCI. Uh, that was back in 2001, and um, I said to myself, I'm going to make the most of this opportunity and prove that I'm really capable. And I was fortunate uh, that my first task was as a filing clerk in the filing room. And I really enjoyed it because I had the opportunity to learn a lot because all the material was there and I was uh, uh, reading various information, investment files, how do you go about it. And um, how I got the job from intern first to an employee was uh, the then CEO decided to administer a quiz on the staff on their knowledge of the business. And because I'd been in the filing room for three months, I did very well. Yeah. And I was offered a job on the spot. Yeah. And that's how I got my job. And it's been um, one step after another since then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but uh, to the point that when you came in as CEO now, rising through the ranks, uh, Centum was controlling assets worth about 60 billion Kenyan shillings. Yeah. Now we are at 180 billion. Yeah. How have you managed to triple this bill? Yeah, I, I, took, I was appointed CEO in late 2008 so it's been about nine years it's it's, it's been quite a while uh, we've worked we started off first by uh, in 2009 the first task was uh, developing a strategic plan uh, getting alignment because that was critical and in the first phase of our strategic plan we came up with five objectives uh, we had an objective around asset growth that was to move from at the time six billion shillings to about 30 billion shillings by in the first five years. We had a plan on uh, return, we had a target on brand, we had a target on costs, we had a target to also geographically diversify. And in the first uh, period, the first five year period, uh, we exceeded uh, our strategic objectives on all five, five measures. And that was primarily because we were aligned on the vision and the mission and the strategy. And we kept it consistent. Uh, you know, we did not meet again to change it. We, we, we remained very focused on what it is that we wanted to do. And that enabled me as the head of the management team then to build a management team and processes in a relatively stable uh, uh, environment. We then had our second review, what we're now currently in, which is Centum 3.0, at the beginning of uh, 2014. And that was a strategic plan to take us to 2019. We had again objectives in five areas. Uh, asset growth was one of them. We are largely on track. Uh, we are now three years into it. We have two years to go. We had a target on return. We have not performed. We've performed well, but not to the level that we'd expected. We'd expected to perform to return about 35% year on year. We are now trending at around 26% on uh, NAV. We had a target on costs. We are well within it. We had a target on uh, brand. Uh, we continue to grow our our brand. So I think the ability to be aligned as an organization, to have stability, to focus consistently on a few things, because these things take time to build, and then to enable you to build a team that is then aligned with that, I think that has been very important in uh, meeting the various strategic objectives. Yeah. Now, uh, let's get back to the organization itself. I mean, you've mentioned your strategy now, Centum 3.0, but what's the underlying culture of Centum? What drives people to come and do what they do every day? I think our, our vision at Centum is to, and, and right now what you're doing, is to create uh, investable opportunities at scale. It is to create what does not exist. It is that movement from vision making it into into reality and and doing it at uh, at scale and we have successfully done it in in a number of areas uh, if i look at our real estate uh, asset class 
uh, we have a number of projects, but if I pick one that many people are familiar with, which is the Two Rivers project, that's 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 a project that the team we initiated the idea of creating a mixed use uh, development uh, at scale, uh, a city at scale, and uh, and we and we are well within that. And today I think the first phase that has opened is perhaps uh, it's perhaps today is the most successful in the in, in, you know in the region, and that is. And, and, and that was not an easy an easy challenge because to to pull off that project even the current phase of the project we had to raise in excess of 200 million dollars we had to build a team from scratch and we had to execute what was perhaps the largest uh, uh, single building rollout in the, in the region and we are doing it in a number of other areas if i pick an area like um, even our even legacy assets that we had like in manufacturing if I pick an example of our beverage portfolio, where we've gone ahead and consolidated three companies into one, created Almasi Beverages, uh, over the last uh, two years, uh, that plant has, we've invested in excess of uh, six billion shillings, built a totally brand new plant, uh, expand, significantly expanded capacity. So our, our culture is a creation culture. We are not just looking at um, small improvements. We are looking at uh, participating in transformational uh, projects and opportunities, and creating platform companies at scale. And now we are doing it in new in new areas. Uh, an example is in is in agriculture, which is an area that we in 2014 we made a decision to get into, and we've just uh, we're in the process of completing the acquisition of uh, about 14,000 acres in Uganda. And that is to allow us to do um, an end-to-end -end vertically integrated uh, agricultural um, setup from primary production to, to storage and uh, to value addition. Again, is that it's at scale. Uh, what we want to, what we are currently working on at uh, the coast in in Vipingo is an industrial city. So that's that's really uh, that's 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 a culture here. It's a culture of um, yes, this is what you did in the past, but those past successes in the past it's always looking forward it's moving forward with a sense of urgency um, overcoming whatever challenges are there and uh, really delivering results and delivering them at a very high standard mm -hmm. that sounds very vibrant and I mean um, looking at the point when you started as CEO now um, you know obviously looking at that time the average uh, age of CEO you are way below that so how do people talk about your leadership style or how do you talk about your leadership style in the company uh, i was very fortunate that the board entrusted me with the responsibility of managing this company at the time i was 30. Um, so because of that i was very hands-on you know I'm, I'm the kind of person who works very much with the team and uh, and very involved in, in in various things obviously when i took over as ceo the only nine members of staff. Today, across the group, there are 8,000 people. Centum specifically, we are more than 100. So that has had to change, uh, because now you are focusing more on building an institutional culture, uh, sort of institutionalizing processes. So we, we've gone through the various evolution uh, of an organization. Now we are at a phase where we are focusing more on institutionalizing, or being more deliberate about our culture, institutionalizing uh, processes because you cannot be everywhere at the same time strengthening those processes strengthening uh, leadership capacity across the various uh, levels we have businesses in other parts uh, outside the country so it's been a journey and no year has been the same and and every year as a result of that growth we've uh, faced very different uh, very different challenges, at least in my leadership journey. Every year has been different from the from previous year. I think the challenge for a leader is that you need to be several steps ahead of your organization and therefore you need to focus on developing yourself because uh, the leader is a constraint to the growth of the organization. And so my personal challenge is to ensure that I have the skill and the capacity to be an effective leader to continue to grow this organization through its different phases. And I think once as a leader you the organization outgrows you, then your time has come to then step aside and let others come in. Uh, and that has been really my focus is to make sure I remain ahead
and and therefore also remain ambitious for the organization that we can be we can do more we can be more effective we can do more things simultaneously and um, and that has meant that uh, my focus has not just been on building the assets because that is the external part of what you see but also building institutional capability which is the inner part of what will ensure the machine continues humming. Mm -hmm. and, and how does that inform uh, the kind of talent that you tap into the company? Because growing from uh, nine people, you say, to 8,000, I mean, it's huge growth. So the people issue now is a big, big on our agenda. Uh, and, and it's challenging for us because we're in different areas. We're in different areas at scale because typically most companies are focusing on one business and they grow through that business organically. Now you're, you're, you're in different areas, you're in different areas at scale, you have very short timelines of growth, you have very limited room for failure, so, and therefore, you need, yes, to bring in people, leaders for tomorrow, and we are very aggressive on that, and we've had a fairly successful graduate training program, but you must also bring in capable and competent middle management, and senior management who are specialists in the different sectors and then noting that these people are coming from different organizations try to harmonize the culture so that you don't end up with the different cultures and cultures that are aligned to the strategic objectives of the company and then also build process so so that's why i say the people agenda in fact from my perspective uh, capital is one thing, and capital is relatively easier to fix. The more difficult thing is the people, and that's where the bigger opportunities, and that's where you have a competitive advantage. And so I'm ending up now spending a lot more time on the people side of the business to make sure that we have the capacity required at all levels to be able to grow. We've had to recruit internationally. We've ended up with senior leaders from different nationalities because at a senior level you're looking to recruit a specialist not a generalist you're looking to recruit people with 20 30 years experience in, in various uh, areas and and therefore you're also looking to recruit the best in the world and to make yourself very attractive mm -hmm. but also you're looking to create an environment internally where you can bring in senior level people and they will uh, enjoy themselves and that they will thrive and, and, and build teams. All right. Yeah. Uh, let's take a pause there and uh, we'll be going for a short break, but do not go too far because we'll be back with James Moria this time around talking about the economy of Kenya and where we are going. Don't go too far. Welcome back to Captains of Industry. We're still in Nairobi talking to James Moy, the CEO of Centum Investments. And James, we talked about people and what you're doing in the organization, but let's look at the economy, the operating space, operating in seven sectors. But as a country, we're at a point where there's a lot happening. We have now a prolonged period of politics, uh, interest rates still capped, and there's been a lot of conversation about that. What's your reading of the economy at this point? I'm bullish about uh, Kenya, about East Africa, and generally, I, I think the prospects are, are great. Uh, if you're looking at it in the medium to long term, the fundamental drivers of the economy have not changed. You know, you have demographics in our, in our favor. You have Kenya as really the, the core of the East African, uh, you, know, you know, economies and, and, and this growth there. You ha you've had significant improvement in infrastructure, etc. So the fundamental drivers of our, of our growth remain. And I think that's why after August 8th, you saw a significant bull run on the NSE. Yeah. And a lot of investors who are participating in the market are, are not just local, they're also international. So this view, I think, is backed up by the market and also backed up by consensus view amongst investors okay in the midst of that sort of long-term trajectory yeah. you then have various storms and headwinds and the reason i call them storms is because they are short-term interruptions and generally markets don't like uncertainty 
and that's why when you saw the ruling, uh, uh, then you saw the market responding the way it did because the market did not expect that, mm. and therefore, so we've had uh, pockets of uncertainty, but I don't think you, one should confuse pockets of uncertainty to that being the long-term norm. Mm. My sense is that yes, shocks do come, but those shocks are not so fundamental as to affect the long-term uh, outlook of the economy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and let, let, let's discuss politics first because I think that's more short-term than perhaps what we've had with interest rates. Mm. And uh, you know, it's that sentiment that matters because if you look, you mentioned the NSE, but the foreign investors have been selling quite a bit. Uh, so how do we fix this sentiment now? The fact that we still have about two months of more politics and after that we do not know if we are going to continue the same administration of President Uhuru Kenyatta or have a new uh, administration, uh, most likely being Raila Odinga. Mm. You know what I think is that uh, Kenya is now headed to a good place. Because what was causing the uncertainty before, at least to my understanding, is uncertainty as to whether there will be a disputed election that will lead to violence. Okay. Now that it's established that it is possible you may have a disputed election, but it's going to be re resolved through the rule of law, I think that uncertainty goes away. If you look largely, there's n the policies of a lot of the candidates are the same. It's around employment creation, it's around economic growth, etc. So what my sense of what was spooking investors is uncertainty of what happens in the event the elections are disputed. So with what has happened, I think the positive thing is that the era of violence around elections hopefully is, is behind us. And so in the future, when you have elections, yes, that's, that's what a democracy means. It means every five years, the electorate has a chance to choose a new administration. I think we'll not see the kind of uh, sort of stalling before elections that we have seen uh, in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about interest rates. It's yeah. a conversation that we've been having now for close to a year. And the market and the corporate sector is not uh, very happy about that piece of regulation. Uh, you are in, you're an investor in Cedian Bank. Uh, what do you think of this regulation? Is it about time that it calls for now a relook and see mm. what good and bad? Yeah, OK. The interest rate capping bill was a private member's bill. It was not government policy. It was a private member's bill that was brought by a member and it was supported in parliament in the context of a view generally that the interest rate environment is too high and therefore though credit was widely accessible it was very expensive so what it came to address was a cost of credit uh, at the time central bank opposed it because they felt that what it would actually do it would affect access to credit and kenya bank association be as it may popular sentiment supported it. Uh, the effect it has had is that we've had the slowest credit growth over the last almost 10 years. This has been the lowest credit growth period. So, so what was feared has happened is that yes, although you have through legislation reduced the cost of credit, you've made that credit inaccessible to a large uh, proportion of the economy and that proportion of the economy is the driver and the engine of economic growth so i think to the extent that the legislation has not achieved its intention this is not what the person who originated the legislation had in mind i think it makes sense to review it i think the intention was good uh, economies thrive in environments where cost of credit is low, but perhaps it's time to broaden that conversation and ask ourselves, what are the other drivers? What is keeping credit high? Some of those factors which I think we've shared and I've shared also in various opinion pieces are, we need to look at our public sector spending, we need to look at public sector borrowing, because the cost of credit to the private sector is referenced off the cost of lending to government. And if government appetite is very high for borrowing, then it means that naturally 
public sector lending is also going to be expensive. Mm -hmm. Now, as we talk about the future of Kenya, and there's, there's been this very powerful campaign from the corporate sector, just yeah. trying to show people that it's not all doom and gloom in Kenya. I mean, yes. you can still put your money. In the mid midst of this all, how do you encourage an investor who's not put their money yet in Kenya to come in and invest? I think um, the reason we participated in that campaign and that campaign was funded by the by the private sector is because the the narrative out there was largely political i think it was important to go out there and say yes we are businesses operating in this environment and yes we are successful i think uh, and there's no economy without its challenges if you speak to a ceo in the us today they'll give you their challenges. If you speak to a CEO in China today, they'll give you challenges. In India, they'll give you challenges. But conversely, there are huge opportunities. It is in this same year that we launched Two Rivers Mall in the midst of a lot of challenges, but we've been successful. In certain measures, we've exceeded the targets. I think businesses respond not just to policymakers speaking to them, but investors want to go where other investors are operating and they are successful. And um, I think private sector has a big role to play in shaping the narrative of, of this region, saying we are open for business, we are here, we are successful, we are doing things at scale, we are operating to same global standards and, and come in and, and welcome and, and join us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's wrap up, uh, wrap up this conversation, James. And uh, what's your view of the economy now going forward, your outlook? I mean, you are very optimistic, but uh, we also acknowledge the short-term challenges that we have. The, the Q1 GDP growth this year was much lower, 4.7% compared to 5.4% last year. Where do, we, do you see us going for the next few months as we close the year? I think once we go over this political cycle, um, and given what has been uh, established uh, and that violence is a thing of the past, I, I, I remain very, you know, very positive. There are, there are a lot of opportunities. The reason why we had a challenge in Q1 was also because of the challenges we have in our agricultural sector. Um, again, that presents wonderful uh, investment opportunities, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, for investors. So I, I, I remain positive. We, we, we don't invest for the short term. We don't invest because you're looking for a payoff in six months or one year. We invest because you have a longer term view. And uh, that longer term view for us has not, has not changed. Uh, I would r dare say that our fundamentals are, are stronger than they were uh, you know, you know, in the past. If you look at uh, the key drivers of competitiveness, if I go through the key ones and the what are considered the basic factors, the first one is rule of law. I think over the last five years, the state of the rule of law in Kenya has significantly improved. The institutional setup around rule of law, separation of uh, powers, I think that has significantly improved and perhaps Kenya now is leading. If I look at the second one is quality of the infrastructure. Quality of infrastructure has improved, whether you're looking at roads, uh, ports, uh, power that has significantly improved. Today, no one is saying, I don't have, a, I don't have access to electricity. Uh, even in very remote areas, you know, electrification rates are now very, you know, very high, very big uh, infrastructure. The, the third one is the quality of healthcare, public education systems, etc. Over the last five years, yes, there have been challenges, but there's been improvement. Uh, Today, if you're looking for a graduate, you'll not struggle to find them. Uh, and, and the fourth one is the stability of the monetary environment. If you look at the currency, it has remained largely stable. Um, a lot of other African countries have, uh, if you look at Nigeria, uh, hugely volatile, uh, significant depreciation. We are not there. It's very stable. Interest rates, largely uh, stable. So we have m more things that are working. I would say 80-90% is working. And on certain areas, we are very advanced. If you look at the sophistication of the banking sector, it's way up there with the best. If you look at the sophistication of our technology sector, it's very good. If you look at our service sector, 
it is great. So 90%, 99%, 95% is good, is, is, is great. We have certain challenges. I think you, you deal with those challenges and uh, we are home and dry. Right. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, James Mori. We'll leave it there. Fantastic. Yeah. Right. And thank you for watching Captains of Industry. That has been James Mori, the CEO of Centum Investments. See you. My name is Charles Gitonga.